Mr. Bowersox? Here. Ms. Shenoweth? Present. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Roberts? Here. Mr. Smythe? Here. Ms. Stevenson? Present. Mayor Pressing? Here. Okay, are there any additions to the agenda? Staff report? Seeing none, um, entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting so of uh, August 8th. So moved. Second. moved and seconded by Lynn Barnes. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, minutes are approved. Uh, we have uh, four individuals that wish to speak to the public. Uh, uh, Mr. Edward Bland, if you would please we just remind everybody uh, five minutes or less, please. Hi, my name is Ed. Ed my name is Ed Blaine. I'm the director for the Housing Authority of Champaign County. I came to address the council tonight because at the, at the last board meeting, uh, it was said there was a letter issued to me on some response, so I wanted to bring those to you um, for some clarification. I, if it's okay, I'd like to pass them out, and I'll try to go through them as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I decided to come to you tonight because I know we're going to be doing the lakeside uh, development in the future, and I want to try to dispel any rumors out there for certain things. Uh, so hopefully I can, this letter will kind of tell you where we are with Birch Village at the same time, what will happen with the lakeside process. Um, one of the questions that were presented to me where all or when they say you, talking about the, are the housing authority required to offer support at transition service to resident relocated from Lakeside Terrace? Though it's not the HOPE 6 program required this, it's a partial HOPE 6, which means the supported service piece is not a part of that. What we got was the HOPE 6 demolition application. But we are, if you read the response, we are providing the supported service piece, um, which we are not required to do, but we are we're, we're providing that since we asked the families to relocate due, due to uh, no fault of their own. Um, the next question on here, I'm going to try to get through this quickly for my five minutes. Why is the housing thought of displacing residents who tend to be very low in an economic scale without meaningful support transition service? How many people have you displaced? Uh, Lakeside, all of, the, all of the family will be relocated uh, to suitable housing. Some of the families had decided to stay in the area. Some have relocated out of the area, but all the family relocated into, into suitable house. And when you read through that response, you will kind of see it. And we have we we provide uh, service to them through using uh, the Urban League, um, the Illinois Employment Training Center, Parkland College, and the uh, Urbana uh, have a piece in here also. The next question real quick was how many Lakeside residents are in the self-sufficient or home ownership program? That's a volunteer program that residents can participate if they want to. We, put, we encourage them to, but it's not a mandate that they must participate in, in that particular program. Um, no, next question, how many residents are you referred to social agency and the person is saying, I'm not talking about giving resident brochure or telling them to call an agency. We provide referrals to them for the various agencies that have their expertise. Uh, you know, one thing we don't want the housing authority, we, we don't consider to be an expert at social service, but we have the agencies within the locale that have that expertise, and we refer them to those various agencies, as you see in the response. Next is, how many Lakeside residents have housing authority actually counts and given giving things like bus token or personal reference to social service agency. We provide tokens to them. We even have provided transportation, making sure they're able to go out and find a suitable housing. Uh, number six, how many employees do you have counseling Lakeside Terrace residents, and do you have a record of such? Yes, we have a record. Uh, 
do your employees visit the resident at the home? Yes. Or must the resident come to the office? We visit at the home. They can come to the office. We have the manager. We have that either see them at the office or they can go to the home. But we are providing that level of service to the residents. Next question, how many Lakeside residents did not have a job or GED, and what type of service have you offered them? We don't keep, we are not required by federal statute to keep education data on any resident. That would be in violation of the rights when they make an application. That's not a HUD requirement. We, once again, we refer them to the Urban League or Parkland College for the education piece if they want to take advantage of that. Next question, how many Lakeside residents have indicated they needed help, and how did you help them? And you see the response to that, which is number eight. And number nine is, why are there no black African-American contractors, subcontractors, workers at the Birch Village site? What do you plan to do about it, and what about jobs for former Birch Village residents? Do you have the authority in passing through funds? And you see the response to that is 28 percent of the contract money at Birch Village at this time have been awarded to minority contractors. Basically, so, which is high, because we had a, we were, when we started this, we wanted to make sure that minority contractors were getting a piece of it. And when a person looked at it, they got to remember this is a start-to-finish product. So you may not, you may not see anybody up front, but you got phases. If anybody understands construction, crew understands construction, you know stuff is done in phases from laying the foundation, putting the framing up, doing the siding and stuff like that. Number ten was, how can the public be assured that the situation indicated in number nine above will not be duplicated at Lakeside Terrace? We hope we can duplicate number ten like we had at Birch Village, because, you know, 28 percent is, you know, is tremendous. And the last one is, how can the social service agent help relocate families that do not know who and where they are? Well, once again, we cannot tell any, you know, person or agency where families live because of the Privacy Act. But I just wanted to come in because last week what I heard when I was watching Urbana Council, I just wanted to assure the council that we are doing very well at making sure that the residents are being provided adequate service. Any questions? Questions? I have one quick one. Going back to question number three, the idea of self-sufficiency and home ownership is an important one to me. Why is it that no one has been able to participate in the program? Is it just too high a threshold to get into it? No. This year alone we have had five families come Section 8 homeowners. But they go through a process. We have a contract with Urban League where we pay the Urban League to help them amend the credit. If they have bad credit, we have roughly eight or nine families at the Urban League now amending the credit. Then once they're able to get the credit straight, they go out to a lender like you would do to solicit a mortgage. And then once they solicit that mortgage, the same funds we pay to the rent, to the landlord, we would pay to the mortgage company. But they had to go through a process. And sometimes it may take them two or three years to get to the point where they can meet the criteria that would satisfy a lender. But we have families that are actually all Section 8 homeowners now. Okay. About, follow-up then, about how many a year do you manage to get through the homeownership program? You had five this year. I came here in November 2003, and we started the program in 2004. So far we have five at this point. So I think we're doing extremely well based on the timeline of the families themselves getting their house in order in order to qualify with a lender. But like I said, we use the Urban League as the mechanism to help to work with the families to get them to that point. I guess I'd encourage you to keep working on that program and let us know how it's going. Sure. Any other questions? Danielle. I guess I just have a question. I'm surprised that, I guess I'm missing the picture of what has happened to the 81 families who have relocated from Lakeside Terrace, given that it says here that none of the families relocated have chosen to participate in transitional programs. Is it that they 
is the Section 8 Home Ownership Program. Everyone who was who left Lakeside Terrace was given the opportunity to have a voucher, correct? A voucher or moving to one of our public housing units, yes. Okay. And so what has happened to the 81 families? What's the breakdown in terms it's, of work? It's uh, almost a 50-50 split. Half of the families stayed in Urbana. Half of them went to um, Champaign. Three left the state totally to, uh, to, to other states. Are you, are, um, are you aware of anyone who's homeless at this time? You can't, you can't make a person homeless under the Relocation Act. Okay. So That's in violation of the, of the Relocation Federal Act. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, uh, Aaron Amons. Good evening, council members, uh, Mayor Pressley, and my representative, Robert Lewis. My name is Aaron Ammons of 1108 North Busey in Urbana. Uh, and I'm coming t here tonight to address this, the issue that, uh, that's supposed to take place later on this evening of a closed session in regards to some information that uh, you guys received last week in regards to allegations against, uh, alleged a allegations against an Urbana police officer. Um, so tonight I'm basically here to address uh, what I see is not as individuals but uh, as policies that are being implemented, that are being carried out, being carried out. And what I understand a policy to be is not necessarily something that is written on paper, but it is the actual consistent actions of those who are in authority and have the ability to carry out those particular policies. And so what I uh, personally want to say is that I have been involved with, or I was personally involved with, the trial of a, a young man here in Champaign County where he was a tried, or he was tried on, a, on five different charges. Two counts of home invasion, one count of unlawful restraint, one count of criminal sexual assault, I believe, and intimidation. And he faced up to 120 years in prison with absolutely no evidence at all. None. No physical evidence, no witnesses, and the witness who did, the alleged victim, was indeed inconsistent with her statements. So what I'm afraid of, or what worries me, is that if this is, this is indeed true, that this particular officer has done these things, or this crime has been committed, or if there's evidence that this crime has been committed, and that there's any sort of uh, cover-up or any sort of sweeping under the rug of this particular incident by anyone, then I can see where it will completely destroy the aspirations and the hope of the members of this community to think that as an African American, I'm going to be charged and face death, basically, or to face life imprisonment without any evidence. But we have individuals who are above the law who will commit such crimes, have evidence that these particular crimes have been committed, and they don't even have to face charges. I would wonder what country we actually live in if that was so. And I cannot see how you would expect anyone, let alone the members of the African American community, to ever buy into a system that would treat us in such a manner. So I would hope that if this is indeed true, if there's some evidence that comes out of this that uh, you all find in your closed session, that I hope that you uh, are very adamant about making sure that these charges are pressed and that this individual is brought to justice or that justice can be served so that there can be an opportunity for the victim to be heard or for this officer to be exonerated. But certainly I believe that it would be unfair and preferential treatment for him not to be charged in the same manner as any other citizen. Thank you. Questions? Mayor Pressing. I would like to respond um, just to tell you that we are having a meeting about this, but all the council members are aware that we have an investigation of this by the city and we cannot bias that investigation one way or another, so that is why we are going to be um, not making any public comments until our investigation is completed. But we intend to do it the right way. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. 
Uh, next up, uh, Martel Miller. Did I get your first name right there? Okay. Good evening, Council. Um, I'm coming back behind what Aaron was saying about the, the meeting y'all having after the closed meeting y'all having about the officer. And um, is, is my partner, and my friend, and my cousin. We have an organization called Via Visionary Educated Youth and Adults. Um, he, he's the one that had the charges, and there was no evidence collected on his charges. And uh, the officer that did come to court said in court the only time he collected evidence, this is one of y'all officers of, Champ of Urbana, the only time he collected evidence is to a murder. He never entered the house. I wanted to get that out. And what I have allegedly heard about what was going on with this officer here, I heard he Poser went to the women's job. This is hearsay. I don't know if it's true or not. He used yard equipment to track out where she stayed. And to me, that is a predator. That's not someone committing a crime. That is someone just looking to do something. And I wish if y'all going back to talk about this, to look at the, the evidence I heard that's out there on him, to look in that and to give us justice. And another question, I don't know if I should address y'all about it. It's um, about the special prosecutor. You know, we're using a local special prosecutor, and I don't think that is fair to our community for to have the special prosecutor to be in house. You know, it should be out in another county or someone else. It should, it should not be handled in Champaign County. That is not fair to our community. And that's about all I have to say. Questions? Thank you. Uh, George Carlisle, uh, on the topic of uh, Canopy Club uh, being smoke-free. George Carlisle at uh, 406 East Green, Urbana. The other night when I was coming home from the opera, Marriage of Figaro at uh, Smith Music Hall, since there's no parking at Smith, I had to park underneath Craner. I passed by Canopy Club. Not only was the noise so loud, you could hear it from the sidewalk, even through the closed fire escape doors, but the cigarette smoke was passing through. I just received the calendar Craner at the center stage for September, and I noticed that one of the events as part of the opening of this season will be at Canopy Club on September 15th, and the Canopy Club is a very smoky place. And I would like to see some action taking that at least for the time being that night the Canopy Club be designated smoke free because a lot of people who ordinarily go to Craner Center and do not breathe smoke in any of the auditoriums nor in the lobby, uh, although some people step outside the back door to smoke, uh, would have to breathe the smoke uh, for the music program that will be there and there'll be more of a folk uh, type venue. I'm not too familiar with the person who's playing since I'm mostly a classical fan myself, but. Uh, we do need to do something about that. Uh, the CU Smoke Free Group has been filling out cards, and they've been sending them to the Champaign uh, uh, City Council members. Those people live in Champaign. Uh, you may have seen us at the booth that we've had at Farmer's Market from time to time. We plan to have one at the Sweet Corn Festival and at least one or two more Farmer's Markets. Uh, and uh, if, if at all possible, if we can get a booth for Quad Day, we may or may not, depends on if there's any last minute cancellations, but we hope to be there one way or the other. And a number of cards. I have a sheet that was passed out the last smoke free meeting that I'll give to you that has a number of uh, people so far who filled out quad cards that would go to their respective council members, and every one of them is in support of a, a smoke-free ordinance in Urbana. So uh, the, the situation is that uh, Champaign is scheduling a meeting on September 13th. You may have seen an ad about, I believe it was in last night's paper. And so the smoke-free group is withholding, sending the cards to Urbana City Council members until after that Champaign meeting. But uh, since it's only two days before the Canopy Club event, uh, we need to do something. And, I'll give a copy of this sheet so at least you know that how many people uh, 
have thus far signed cards. I'm sure we'll get a lot more this week, Corn Festival this weekend, and uh, also the uh, if we get quad day. Are there any questions for Mr. Carlisle? I have, a, I have a quick one for you. Has anybody to talked to the uh, owner or management of the Canopy Club about this? I don't know myself uh, who's involved, but I think somebody should. I, I would encourage you to. Uh, anybody else from the public? Uh, okay, Dennis Roberts. Dennis wanted to address us. Yes, uh, um, as you know, um, I've expressed an interest in um, encouraging uh, the city of Urbana to uh, to move in some way to express uh, a desire on the part of the residents of the city to uh, the board of uh, trustees at the University of Illinois to in some way bring a quick resolution to the um, issue that has divided the campus and the community for about 15 years concerning the use of uh, Native American imagery in the sports teams. Uh, the city council has has sent, different members of the city council have commented to me by email and other means uh, a great reluctance to take up this topic for, um, I think, very thoughtful reasons. And I appreciate their um, concern about um, whether it's appropriate for the city to speak on an issue that's basically a university issue, whether it's um, useful for the city to enter into a discussion which actually has been going on for so many years and was completely thoroughly covered during um, the Board of Trustees fact-finding uh, session um, about two years ago. I guess that for myself, I mean, maybe I am a considered a, a come-lately kind of individual to be making comments about this. Um, I've actually tracked the uh, question about the the chief's image in our culture here and, and its overtones of um, misrepresenting Native Americans and their culture. Since arriving here, and I have collected four or five folders full of articles, letters to the editor, comments, uh, brochures, and yet I've never um, attended very few, you know, anti-chief rallies or pro-chief, you know, meetings. Um, it was really my own personal um, uh, experience back at the Navajo Indian Reservation in June when I spent 10 days camping that when I came back, I thought, you know, this issue has been in the town and has kind of festered in the community for so long. Is there anything that's possible to do to bring it to a to bring it to a, a useful and um, creative end. My third, first thought was that we could create a resolution saying that we support the retirement of the chief and moving to other things, new things. I think the university has an opportunity to, to actually um, create something new by, by ending something old, and that's a part of a previous century. You know, the, it, when you, it's like a divorce. You have a bad marriage, things are not going well. When you finally call it quits, it allows for something new to take place, new relationships to form. And I think that the university has been dating the chief for a long time. I think that indeed, now the chief has gotten himself dated, and it really would be appropriate to move into the 21st century with a new image. I don't have any um, heavy expectations of what might happen among our group. Um, I know we still have a lot of different feelings about it. <coughs> I did ask the um, City Human Relations uh, Commission to give some guidance 
on whether there is a situation of um, in, the, in the town which uh, creates a, a hindrance to individuals of minority cultures in some way which the city could address or correct due to the uh, presence of the chief. And more information will come from them on September 14th when they meet. And I have talked to Cole Cumson, who's been asked to be the point person and has had experience in the chief relations. And just um, before the meeting today, uh, the mayor was nice enough to share a letter with the council people which outlines the position that the chief uh, on the chief that the, the, that the commission took two years ago. I've talked to the people at um, Native American House on campus concerning a possible um, evening of um, uh, education or um, information concerning uh, the Native American situation in modern modern in the modern world and in our community. You know, it's kind of disheartening because they say that they've addressed this issue for so many years, it's very tiring for them to bear the burden of coming to every meeting that is held and continually have no, effectively no um, change. Two individuals who are Native American and live in our community have written to the council members and I have copied their letters and they're on the back table if you wish to read them. And I think you'll find them somewhat daunting and somewhat frustrated and somewhat hopeless in their expectations of what could happen in the city of Urbana. And I understand that there's no guarantee of anything really occurring. Uh, the council would have to uh, resolve to take a um, a position which maybe is uncomfortable or uh, perhaps isn't seen to be directly um, bearing on city business. But I think that it behooves, behooves people in government to have ideals, to talk about goals for the future, and to uh, think beyond the box of their assigned roles to participate in what is good and helps growth for the community as a whole. So I'm just at this point saying that I appreciate all the efforts and the thoughts that everybody on the council have, have shared with me. And whether anything really happens here or not um, may not be uh, what determines the course of this um, thoughtful conversation at the university. I'd like the city to be on the side of the people who spoke up and said it's time to move on. But if it's not possible, um, maybe individuals on council would be willing to uh, put their signatures to such a document. And after the Human Relations Commission meets in September and I get some um, feedback from them on what seems feasible, um, I'll talk to us again about no potential new solutions. So um, I'm very respectful for all of our concerns on council, and I know that um, the chief is a, a dear and beloved symbol. But you know, um, life is change, and sometimes a miracle is to change consciousness. Okay, that's all I really want to say, and I appreciate your time. Anyone else? I do have a public announcement as well. Um, the Sweet Corn Festival is this weekend. I want everybody on council and the public to be aware. And I stopped by the UVA today. Preparations are busy, busy, busy. A lot of people from the public as well as UVA volunteers and everyone are helping. I think this flyer will come in the paper Wednesday, so I hope everyone looks for it and comes out to the festivities that start uh, Friday evening and then run all day Saturday this weekend downtown. Brandon, what time do things start Friday? There's a schedule on the back. Uh, things kick off Friday, that's August 26th, at 5 p.m. and go until 11. There are a number of bands playing. I won't 
try to reproduce the whole schedule here. And then on Saturday, there's also music, fun activities from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on into the agenda, item number five is an ordinance is ordinance number 2005-08-132, an ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance, the demolition costs associated with the Kmart site. Mr. Walden. Follow-up ordinance. Bruce, you're, you're not talking into the microphone. Oh. Are the microphones not on? Oh. Is this one on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, um, the budget ramifications um, are this. The proposal is to uh, utilize funds within the Economic Development Fund for this purpose. Um, the balance of the Economic Development Fund is about a million six at the present time. Um, if you look in your budget document, you'll see that two things have happened since that time. One is that we had an unexpected revenue, which is almost equal to this amount, which was uh, 285, which was the refinancing of the of a mortgage doc, a mortgage um, that yielded uh, revenues to the city. Uh, this happens to equal the that amount. So. Um, if you look at your budget document, since these two numbers cancel each other out, the remaining balance is a million and a half. So, and I recommend approval. Mr. Brandon. Yeah, I would move that we send this ordinance to council with recommendation for approval. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Barasak, seconded by Ms. Stevenson. Any further discussion? Brandon. I did have one brief question for staff. Um, Bruce, do you have any update for us on the timing of the demolition and when things get started? I remember it was sort of the August, September timeline, and I haven't driven by this week, but what do you know? Um, only that they're working out the details on the closing on the land, and as soon as that takes place, they intend to be going as fast as they can to get moving. Okay, thanks. Any, anybody else? Seeing none, all those in favor of sending this to council signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Off to council. <laughs> Item number six is an ordinance is ordinance number 2005-08-129, an ordinance amending Schedule H of Section 23-93 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code requiring stop signs at a certain intersection, Lydia Court West at Myra Ridge Drive. Mr. Gray. Thank you. This is a um, recently completed street and uh, new, newer subdivision with homes becoming occupied and it's a local street intersecting with the collector street and typically uh, consistently we would have the local street stop for the collector street and this is a one-way stop. The uh, east leg at this intersection uh, already has a stop sign so it would be a two-way stop in total stopping at Meyer Ridge. A motion would be in order. I would move that. Uh, go ahead, no, Heather. No, I no, want you no, to do it. No, go ahead. Okay. I looked, pointed at both of you. Sorry. I move that we send ordinance number 2005-08-129 to council for approval. And I would like to second that. Okay. Moved by Heather Stevenson and seconded by Dennis Roberts. Sends to council any discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? It goes to council. Uh, next up is this ordinance number 2005-08-130, ordinance amending Schedule L of Section 23187 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code prohibiting parking in specified places, Romine Street at Hill Street. Mr. Gray. We uh, <coughs> received uh, comments from residents in this area, Romine and Hill intersection, and stated the um, uh, safety concerns at this intersection with the considerable amount of parking that's going on in this area and we looked at this intersection and recommend that the no parking be extended than where it's currently at for safety reasons and this is again in request in response to people that live in the neighborhood. So it adds what like 20 feet more yellow space or something? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any any discussion? Was there any plans to deal with Matthew? Well, it's the same problem. I'm not aware of the request. So, okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Roberts. Um, 
since the uh, dis the um, discussion in the uh, ordinance background uh, indicated that it was um, to improve the um, uh, site triangles at the corner, I was wondering if um, it has occurred yet that uh, new or revised site regulations have ever been drafted? There's no the new uh, regulations at this time. Okay. Lynn. I would, I would uh, recommend that we move ordinance number 2005-08130 on to council for, uh, recommend, with recommendation for approval. Second. Uh, moved by Lynn Barnes, second by uh, Robert Lewis. <laughs> okay. Um, to send this to council. Any further discussion? All those in favor of signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It's off to council. And uh, Mr. Gray is on a roll here. Number eight, ordinance number 2508-125, an ordinance approving and authorizing the execution of an agreement with Gabriel Omo Osagi, a pedestrian bridge. Um, this uh, item is similar to um, council action that took place with the Maxley's uh, ownership of the building just to the east. Um, this bridge, pedestrian bridge, is in need of replacement. And we have had our uh, architect engineers look at this, and it's part of uh, a bid package to do parking deck repairs, which we'll be receiving bids next week for. Um, the owner of the building, uh, 123 West Main, um, is agreeable to the language in the attached agreements. And essentially, it states that the city will replace at its city expense the bridge and then once completed that the owner at 123 would then um, own and retain and maintain in perpetuity that pedestrian bridge. There was no particular d such documentation back when this bridge was originally built so um, this was something that was acceptable. Uh, certainly to the owner and, and understands the future costs and responsibilities, but at this point the city would be replacing the bridge. Question. Danielle. Yeah, I'm, I'm really confused by this. Um, why is it, um, I, it makes sense that the city would pay for the demolition of the bridge. It does not make sense that the city would pay for the construction of a new bridge, simply because this isn't the only way in which people can have access to this building. They can access it from the front. It's a convenience that they're able to access it from the back. That's a convenience that goes to the tenants of the building, and the tenants of the building um, pay the owner for, for that convenience. So I don't understand why the owner of the building is not paying to, to build, rebuild the bridge if, if he sh so chooses to do that. Um, it, that seems to be the, the fairest way of doing this. Um, the other way, otherwise it kind of seems like a giveaway. The other way is why is this cost not shared? It's just 50-50. Um, we don't know who owns it. You pay half, we pay half. I don't understand why the city is responsible for a bridge that accesses a, a private dwelling in downtown unless it's part of the redevelopment package of that property, in which case it would be an economic development um, incentive piece. But there's there's nothing, I don't see the positive with the city other than the fact that they maintain the bridge in the future. Um, but so I guess I need clarification here. I think the best answer that I could give you is what you stated and that it's part of us trying to keep a business and location viable and you can roll it into like an economic development type uh, incentive, if you will. It is a convenience thing. It is frequently used for second floor access, and there are many people that rent or use spaces in the parking deck that work there. So it's certainly a direct access convenience thing. I can't give you any other answers. Was, was it, did the city ever say, we think you should contribute to this, and mm -hmm. the owner say no? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's, we have another tenant um, down the way who, or another um, owner of a building, and they received full responsibility for the bridge, but they didn't receive 
they didn't have any upgrades made to the bridge when they received full mm -hmm. responsibility. So I don't, I don't see how these. The bridge was in good. That bridge was in this bridge almost. If we leave it the way it is, it's going to have to be closed and, and, and removed. It's there, no comparison of the condition of the two bridges. So this one had to be removed, and either doesn't be replaced or it does be replaced, and we're suggesting it be replaced. Mr. Roberts, uh, what guarantees or penalties are uh, established on the part for the for the city's safety? If the bridge is uh, falling in disrepair, we would uh, condemn it and remove it, and that would require probably years of passage if it's been rebuilt. You, I mean, that would be sometime in the in the far future. I'm imagining. No, it's it's in disrepair and and needs to be replaced. Well, I mean, after the if this happens and the owner becomes truly the owner of this bridge. What, what kind of um, conditions or um, regulations do we have concerning its upkeep? Did it, do we require you know snow removal on this bridge in the winter time? Or I mean, are there there are other things that are that the city re would require of the owner of this bridge? Now that it would be he would it would be, be that owner. owner's responsibility, yes, for snow removal, any kind of maintenance of the bridge, yes. Other questions? Mayor Preston. Do we inspect the bridge periodically once it becomes this owner's bridge? We probably would. We do have people qualified to do that, but um, only for our protection because it's connected to the deck. Brendan. Um, as a follow-up to Dennis's question, I guess, the I understand that the responsibility to maintain, remove snow and all that falls to the owner after the city would initially repair the bridge. But is there any requirement or any thing we would do to make sure that actually happens other than, you know, if the bridge went 25 years, mm -hmm. you know, we fix it up now, goes 25 mm -hmm. years without maintenance, other than us condemning it then and removing the bridge, are there any other things to ensure the maintenance does happen? I guess I would treat it as property like any other business that has private property. and. and you know, if businesses shovel the snow in front of their business, they would do it here, and, and if they don't, they don't. Um, so the responsibility would be as if it's physically part of the property and structure. So um, if it falls in disrepair, just like any other structure that may fall in disrepair, and we've had those downtown with bricks falling off and such. You know, our building community development department gets involved, and they contact the owner and, and uh, ensure that, you know, the public safety is maintained, and if we have to close a portion of the alley or the bridge or what have you for these things, that's what happens. So there is a role that the Community Development Department has in that respect. So I think it would be no different than any other building or structure in the city. A follow-up question. It, does this agreement run with the land? It is recorded? Yes. As a, okay. It will. And any future owners. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thanks. I don't diminish the, the cost here. It's 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 very high, and um, it's you know, ultimately obviously council decision here. But um, I can't give you any any other reasons other than if you want to look at it as um, an enhancement or an economic development type incentive, that'd probably be the best um, aspect I could put on something like this. But um, the owner was not interested in putting any money towards a new bridge replacement. So we have basically this option. The other option is is that since it's technically ours currently, then um, if this decision is no, then the alternative is we'll have to spend some money and remove it and, and make it safe uh, and brick up that old opening at the, at the deck. So, Do you have some um, estimate of that cost? It's probably going to be in the $10,000 range. Um, it's kind of a difficult removal type site. Um, there's some patchwork and such, and, and then... Uh, there's a door that would have to be permanently secure right. on the property too. Dennis. Well, I think it's. Um, it was I guess I'm a little surprised to hear that the current owner had no interest in putting any energy into maintaining the bridge, and if if the bridge is for the benefit of his tenants, um, 
maybe we should just go with his opinion it's not worth keeping up if it's not worth keeping up for him for his own tenets why would it be worth keeping up for us to provide his tenants with a quicker way to get to the second floor mm -hmm. I'm having a problem with the um, with the concept of the understanding of um, you know you know where, where benefit is if the owner of the building doesn't see one well, all I would add is I know the owner is making improvements to the building and there's some first floor <coughs> changes <coughs> forthcoming. I believe there's a facade or some kind of loan that community development is working on with him too. So there are some enhancements to the building that are occurring. So I know there's some reinvestment going on with the building itself. Lynn? So really what we're looking at is about a $50,000 economic development improvement uh, to enhance that property so that future tenants might want to be a part of that property mm -hmm. or that tenants that are there will want to continue mm -hmm. to stay. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, this didn't get um, acted upon and dealt with in 30 years ago, whatever, when it was built. So um, that was the time to nail down the ownership and responsibility. So um, we're trying to deal with that now. Danielle. Um, according to the, one of the things that makes me uncomfortable about this is it says replacement estimates are over 60000 mm -hmm. It doesn't say what they're under because it sounds like we actually don't have estimates yet. So we're committing to something without a cap on the price. That's, that's one thing that I think council members need to understand. I'm uncomfortable with that. Second, um, this, if this was tied to the owner investing in his property, then it would make a lot of sense to me because it's part of an impact. It's, it's we give something, we receive something in return. That's typically how, I haven't seen anything like this before. Typically we, we give something when we receive something in return. In this case, we're giving something. There's a potential plan that there will be some improvements. We haven't seen that plan. The, so I, at this point, I'm not inclined to support this, although I think I could support something if it was, if I saw what the, investment on the part of the landowner was I just don't think this is good precedent to invest in something not see the um, person come to the table to also invest in their property so that that's a, a concern I have the question I then have is how do we save anything in moving forward with this currently because we have um, deck repairs that are happening is there some cost savings and bundling yes. it with other things such that if we did it later it would cost more and what kind of difference a uh, dollar figure difference estimated would that be well we will be receiving the bids next week um, <clears throat> so we'll know exactly what this cost will be um, <clears throat> that's why I stated over 60,000 I don't know exactly how much at this time yeah. <clears throat> there will definitely be an economy of scale because you'll have a contractor under one contract to do the deck work and, and the bridge pedestrian bridge work to do it separately, you know, I think it could easily be another 20 to 30 percent higher to make it a standalone type project versus all the mobilization, insurance, and et cetera, done under one contract. So, um, when does the deck work start? Well, it'll be September. It starts mm -hmm. September. Yes. Is it possible to see the to see the uh, commitment from the property owner um, in terms of facade work, et cetera, before we? I mean, we can get estimates from the contractor, but before we actually release the contractor to do the work to see what kind of commitment we get from the property owner. Mm -hmm. I can't answer that question this evening. Okay. Um, I, I think the timing is a little tenuous here to get a development agreement tied in with this, but um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd have to. I, I would point people. out that you have an extra week. Um, since we won't be meeting next week, we'll be meeting Tuesday, September 6th. Mm -hmm. So there are two weeks in which to nail this down. Uh, Ms. Stevenson. Uh, Bill, you said that currently the city, this is the city's property? Is that The bridge, the pedestrian bridge is city property, yes. Okay, so we, if something were to happen to someone, it would be the city's responsibility to take care of them if something happened due to the you know, fact that it's a, a, a bad bridge. It's a better attorney answer than myself, but I would say we would be at least responsible to some degree. Uh, you know, whether there'd be other, the other party responsible too, I don't know. Um, so, 
Okay. Ms. Barnes. So at this point, really, our only quid pro quo is lack of, lack of liability, you know, going forward, and in any uh, future improvements that would be mm -hmm. or repairs that would need to be made for the bridge. That's right. kind of the deal as it stands. Yeah, something needs to be done now. <coughs> So it's either it gets closed very soon or it gets replaced, and we were opting, obviously, for the replacement part. But um, so. I put my foot in the mouth. I'll move that ordinance number 002-2005-08125. Move forward with the appropriate changes with regard to the agreement or the spelling of the name of the client. In the agreement portion. Sorry. Agreement of use of right of way. Paragraph A. Gabriel. Oh, sure. Okay. There's a motion to send this to council for approval. Is that? Is there a second? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay. Work on it. For Dennis. Perhaps we have a, uh, perhaps you will entertain a motion to uh, send it forward to council without any approval. Without any recommendation. Without recommendations. And and then we can maybe Just have additional information with regard to the price. Move it. And commitment from the Sorry, landlord, commitment. landowner. Somebody want to come up with another motion? The first motion yeah, dies right. for lack of a second. I move that we Mr. send this to council without any recommendations. I second that. Okay, it's been moved and, s and seconded. Moved by Ms. Stevens and seconded by Lynn Barnes to send this to council with no recommendation. Ms. Barnes. And then as far as discussion about that motion, then that will give a couple weeks for Bill to clarify uh, what the bid looks like and also to let us know if there's any movement on the part of the owner after hearing our discussion, which you can maybe possibly share with him to see if we can get any further commitment from him as to enhancing the entire property. Okay. Danielle? I just wanted to add, um, yes, I think that I think this is an appropriate way to move forward. Um, I think the uh, if folks think that the city is going to pay for things, um, it's important that we not be so quick to pay for things so that we can see if um, uh, property owners will come forward to take care of their properties. Um, in particular, if there's a facade loan, I know that there, I believe there's an application in the works for this property, and I would like to know what the status of that application is at our next meeting. And in particular, I'd like to see what other kinds of things we're looking at granting, because I'm really uncomfortable piecemealing um, economic development agreements. I like to look at everything that's going to be given, everything that's going to be received. It's one package, and we can see whether or not it's fair and makes sense for kind of the long-term uh, you know, benefit of the downtown and the uh, financial benefit to the city. At this point, this this doesn't look like it's a benefit to the city yet, but it, it could with um, other things attached. Mr. Walden? Uh, the only thing I can add is that uh, I do know that mic is bad. It's a dead mic. Um, I do know that the lender and the city approved a some loan documents this last week. Uh, for a restaurant for the facility and I don't know the details of it uh, I don't know the scope of the investment but I think it would be helpful if one of us will it's not my project but I think we'll, we'll be able to put together a description of what's happening at the property I think that would be most helpful to you we'll try to get that together uh, and the details uh, on the loan for your meeting next time Great. I have three quick questions for Mr. Gray um, with the contractor that is doing the that they, with the winning contractor doing the parking deck, um, and obviously you have that person in mind for doing the bridge, would that same firm also be able to do demolition? Should that be the choice? Yes. Okay. And uh, is that part of the bid is an alter, as an alternate is demolition? <coughs> demolition only, you mean? Yeah. Mm, 
All right. Do they have to demolish the bridge to rebuild it? Yes. Oh, okay. So de yeah, okay. Yes. What, what would be different is if it's not being replaced, that would be different details that would okay. have to be worked out. So that would be a change order, but okay. but that could be worked out. Okay. And in terms of the the bridge's current safety, is it safe or should it be closed today? Um, it's still acceptable to walk on it, but okay. the architect engineer looking at it said it, it needs to be addressed soon. So another winter would be bad. Okay. Okay. And then my last question is, uh, you say the city owns it. I read through the notes here. It wasn't clear to me uh, how you came to that conclusion. Did Was it built at the same time the parking deck was built? I believe it was the same time. Um, I I need to check on that to be sure with our records. If it was the same time or shortly thereafter, I don't recall. My recollection is is that it was shortly after the deck opened um, that the city uh, chose to pay for the connection as an effort to occupy the vacant buildings downtown. Okay. And, um, there, and there might have been even talk of trying to connect in other ways, but. I know that there was a policy at the time, which has been more than 20 years ago, to, uh, where possible, connect onto the deck because we had a lot of vacancy in our space downtown at that time. So there was a sort of an urban principle of trying to connect these upper stories to the deck. And so that's what happened is probably 20 years ago or so. Okay, I guess it would be good to have that historical aspect and any records uh, <laughs> to if, if we have them. Uh, I know. But I think, wouldn't there be a building permit? The, this could be a good, this may be 25 years old or older. Uh -huh. And uh, we'll look for it. Okay. Well, we do have somebody in archives who knows where mm -hmm. things are. Uh, while, you, while you're over there, uh, real quickly, um, uh, the restaurant that you're talking about, the first floor, that would benefit from the second floor access because people would park on the upper part of the parking deck or are those 24-hour reserve spots? Oh, no, those are those are not 24-hour reserve. So, the only 24-hour so, reserve spots we have are on the first floor. And then, of course, evenings and weekends, um, the, the non-reserved space is the second floor is available. Okay, so so it really floor. would benefit the restaurant on a first floor or whatever is on the first floor by having second floor access oh, yeah. into the building. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have a motion to send this to council with no recommendation at the moment. Is there any further discussion? Seeing, uh, Mr. Roberts. I would just encourage the owner of the building to come and entrance us with his plans. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, um, that's the last of the action items. Are f uh, we have two items left. Uh, next item is a uh, study session on employee retention and recruitment. Uh, uh, for those, uh, hopefully I uh, brought, uh, there was a document from uh, our July 20th meeting, which has a nice chart on the very back of it, the appointments chart. Does everybody have that? Because I think that'd be very useful. I don't know if it was included in this new package. Yeah. Um, I almost did. Charlie, you may be there. We, we may need. Can we, can we get copies of this real quickly? Because I think it'd help be helpful. Yeah, just the back page. Okay. Mine's got writing on it if you've got a blank one. Do you have a blank one? I have one that just had the appointment. Yeah, okay, yeah, mine's got writing all over it, so. Uh, while that's going on, I'll try to remind us of where we were. Um, we have, um, actually, uh, Bruce's memo of August 16th um, does summarize what we were, where we were at, uh, uh, which was, uh, first item was reducing the number of employees on the annual appointment political list, uh, Chief Administrative Officer, Department Head, Assistant Police Chief, Fire Division Chiefs. Um, there are, there was uh, talk of a longer initial appointment for new employees, uh, point three, and I think, why don't we start with that? Is that sort of, is that a, sort of an, a, a common agreement point that, that whatever we do, there will be a, a longer appointment period to, to give us more flexibility with new, new individuals? Mm -hmm. Dennis, yeah? Yeah, that seems very, um, useful, I would think. 
And uh, it could be that the employment period might be the, the uh, four-year term of the mayor or, you know, in some larger increments of one-year appointments. Okay. Um, that opens up another can of worms, so you understand. We could, you know, we, we, there are some communities like Danville that do four-year appointments. Um, I mean, we could do one, two, four, three, four-year appointments. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's nothing to say that we have to do one-year appointments here. Uh, one, once somebody's appointed, uh, I, clearly we don't want to bind the next council, um, but uh, that's out there, Brandon. Yeah, I think the. I mean, the one-year appointments are something I support. One of the discussions we didn't answer about this was the cutoff, was you know, if you are coming to the city and taking a job in June, and July is the month where we do appointments, we obviously decided we didn't want to give you a one-month appointment, but we didn't decide where that threshold is. And I, as I thought about it, I thought maybe eight-month minimum is something that made sense to me. If you came to the city, and you had eight months still to go before our next normal July appointment cycle, then we would appoint you just for the eight months, and then eight months, which is most of a year, would have gone by, and your appointment would be up again. But if you were taking a job, and it, the time to the appointments was less than eight months, then we would just give you the full extra year, and add on 12 months, and let you serve out your eight months plus your next year um, until your appointment was up again. So. As I thought about numbers, the eight-month minimum for appointments seemed like seemed like that made sense and would be a reasonable cutoff. Bruce, you were going to say something. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, we're on the topic of of, of uh, initial appointment and length of initial appointment. Uh, others have have anything on that? Danielle. You know that the um, mayor had some opinions about the. Um, employment agreement and the minimum and maximum notice period. I guess I'd like to hear from you what your thoughts are at this time. I, I, I haven't, I, I'm trying to remember what was uh, recommended in the. Um, yeah, well, I was, I was going to go and I was sort of going in reverse order here, Dana. Sorry, yeah, order? yeah. So I was doing. I was going to hit three first, then I'll I'll oh, summarize okay. two. Yeah, so that's fine. Um, I don't have any comments about three at this point. Okay. Um, so something to think about is that the length of what that cutoff is. Brandon's recommending eight months. Um, clearly, this is not something we're going to take action on tonight, but uh, we can then uh, get some input from staff on on what they think uh, initial time frame might be. Yeah, Mona's looking at me. Uh, Lynn, I would just say in in all of our considerations, one thing that we need to keep paramount is our desire to recruit and retain excellent qualified people because we're only as good as the people that we are able to hire and keep so i think in all of our thinking and any recommendations the staff would come to us that needs to be kept in mind you know what barriers do, do any of our decisions um what, what could our, our decisions uh cause in terms of being able to recruit people that we want to snag uh for urbana Dennis. Uh, maybe we could talk about what an initial appointment really is. Um, there is, uh, I mean, we're not talking about a, um, a, a um, what do they call it, a promotion, a Probation. probational period. This is, when you're talking about, it, I mean, if you're talking about initial appointments, what is a subsequent appointment and how is that different? Well, on the initial appointment, um, on the initial appointment, the once the person is appointed, then um, of course they could at any appointment, whether it's new or ongoing, the mayor could discharge the person at any time um, by simply doing so and then notifying the council of of that fact. Um, but when a person's up for reappointment, the mayor could simply discharge the person by not reappointing them, by not taking action to reappoint. They are therefore discharged. So that makes a person more vulnerable in that they, there's no requirement of, of any notification of why or, or there even being any reason other than that the, the mayor is not going to reappoint. Um, so I guess the staff recommendation was to 
that the council leave themselves the option of setting that initial appointment period at the time that you are appointing someone. So if you have a really outstanding candidate who says, I'm not going to come without at least a year, knowing that I'll be here a year if I'm going to move my household and all of that, and you want to give that person a year or more than a year, then you could do so. But at the same time, if you had a situation where that really wasn't necessary, as you mentioned, you know, maybe you're only into the appointment period a few months, it's a local candidate or a promotion, and the person's not nervous about being reappointed, then you wouldn't have to give them an arbitrary seven months plus 12 months. You could get them into the normal cycle. Now, the downside of that is that each time you're making that appointment, you'd be making that decision, and I think the practice would probably be normal reappointments, except where you might say a minimum of a year. And any time somebody's moving or, you know, leaving a good job, they probably are reluctant to do so without knowing that the new job's going to at least last a year. Danielle? Another similar kind of question in terms of making this decision. In looking at the agreement with a potential new employee, we're talking about minimums, correct? We're not talking about maximums. So, for example, with the attorney hire, it sounded like, although we have no particular contract process in place with employees, we had started moving forward with establishing a contract with the attorney. So you have the discretion when you hire to actually include things in a contract that are above and beyond what we're discussing today. Is that correct? Not exactly. The contract that was proposed was one that could have been approved by the city council and the mayor, so it couldn't have been approved by the CAO independent. And it still couldn't conflict with the ordinance unless the ordinance permitted it to. So you could write the ordinance to say it will be, you could even do this eight-month thing if you wanted, or a year, whatever you wanted, unless modified by the council at the time of the appointment, which would still give you the authority to modify it where you needed to. Because right now, I'm not sure that you could, if you could write a contract, that would be in violation of your own ordinance. And a lawyer would have to tell you that, but it seems kind of silly to put ourselves in that position. So just to follow up, it appears that one of the things that we might want to consider is doing just that, because I think an annual appointment process is a little bit different than a new hire. And so when we're hiring somebody new, we may want other kinds of incentives to be able to bring them on board. We might want to have the discretion to have a better employment contract or to have certain, you know, extend it for a year or even a year and a half when bringing someone on simply because that's kind of a criteria that they need to relocate here with their families and buy a house and things like that. So at the same time, it sounds like in some ways by ordinance we're kind of establishing a minimum with this. And just a little bit in response to what Lynn said, we could go above and beyond the minimum to have kind of custom agreements with particular staff who we're trying to recruit to the community. Mayor Preston? We have an unusual number of people that are appointed compared to other cities. But in the last 10 years, how many people who have been appointed have not been reappointed? It's not traditionally handled in a public manner. Because I just didn't know that this was really a serious problem. I mean, people think, oh, I have to be reappointed by the mayor and the city council, and that's going to be so tough. But we'd have to know why they weren't reappointed. And I think, well, I understand the history of this, that it was to deal with the civil service, and this was a way to avoid that. Even if it wasn't done publicly, I mean, to your knowledge, how many people are we talking about? It's not one a year, certainly, is it? Are there 10 people in the last 10 years? No, I'd say less, probably. Has it been zero? I think maybe the bigger question is how many people have been nervous about it, and that's probably all the appointees. I mean, why would they be nervous? I mean, if this isn't a problem, why would they be nervous about it? 
if I if I were looking at a job here, I would definitely be I'd be nervous about it, especially if I was moving. Um, rather than to be able to have the opportunity to go through a, you know, probationary period, followed by, you know, if there was something that I wasn't doing or, or if my performance was ebbing, I would have a, you know, disciplinary action or, you know, kind of a process. I mean, would you would you like to see a probationary period? That's what they had at the county. And I think a probationary period is very reasonable, but we're talking about people saying they want to be guaranteed a year. And some people might not work out, and you might not want them here for a year. I, well, I think the, the key decision is how many people are we dealing with? You know, if we're dealing mm -hmm. with the list of whatever, 20 here, versus dealing with a more, what I would advocate for, um, much smaller number, and to be specific, um, six would be what I would recommend. Uh, then I think we kind of start from that point because everybody else then would be civil service and then would be afforded the probationary period, you know, the, the, the disciplinary process, and then we would have six people or positions that we would then uh, develop kind of a, a process around in terms of some guarantees or some probate or a probationary period. Robert. Could you contrast the short term versus the long term? appointment and what it might mean to the city in terms of, uh, as Lynn alluded to, um, stability. Do you mean for the initial appointment? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think... For, for example, if, if the minimum was eight months or whatever, in contrast, if it were like for the term of the office, would that be significant in terms of bringing stability to uh, the employment pool of people that you have with all the appropriate options in terms of contracts and uh, if I have a contract with the person they can leave or I can ask them to leave? Well, even when you are appointed, you can still be discharged with, that, with very little cause. So if you're, if you simply, um, if you only were to have a longer appointment period, I don't think you'd be addressing all the things that the council has raised here. Brendan. Yeah, I have a question just about timing of initial appointment again. If we do set a higher minimum, like 12 months, because your argument does make sense to me that if someone especially is relocating their family here, we really have to guarantee them at least 12 months of employment when they come. In that case, would we say they come in, you know, November of 2005, would we appoint them off cycle until November of 2006 and then try to get them onto the cycle by doing a less than a year appointment so that their next date up would be July of 2007? You could do that or you could just simply put them back in the cycle, but as, as you're clearly uh, inferring here, if, you, if somebody came on uh, just one month shy, then they would end up with a 23-month appointment. And so it depends on how strongly the uh, council felt about wanting to avoid that. But all you're really avoiding with that, uh, with the only thing that is, is really different here is that the mayor would have to state a reason for discharge uh, other than uh, mm -hmm. not reappointing. So it, it's still not a guarantee that of employment. Right. One thing you could do too is um, you could appoint somebody for a year period and then when appointments do come up uh, you could extend their appointment out the necessary months to fill them out to that. You know, so, so, so suppose they go from November to November you know, in June, when the reappointments come up, you just take them and extend them for the remaining, for the remaining eight, months, eight or months or whatever's right. left. That would be one way to do it, to get them back on cycle. Mm -hmm. So you could just do an initial one year to start with and then clean it up at the annual reappointment mm -hmm. time. Um, that, would be, that would be one way to go about that. Uh, Mayor Pressing. Okay, let's say we took um, the top six, as Ms. Barnes has suggested. That means the bottom 14 would be put into civil service, and they would have a six-month probationary period, which they could be let go at any time for any reason. So their security is decreased rather than increased, right? You're, you're asking someone to move their family here and saying that they're going to be on probation. Um, no, you. I, there's... 
I wouldn't consider it a decrease because there isn't much security in an appointment in the first place. And as far as probation, it can be as short as long as you want, and we can have any conditions on discharge that we want. Jumping back to point number one, I'd like to tackle them in reverse order if we could. Lynn, let's try to wrap up point number three here. Anything else on point number three? No. Okay. So do we sort of have a consensus that we're going to do some kind of minimum appointment and then clean it up? So do we want to go with the eight month or a year, whatever the appointee is comfortable with by contract, and then clean it up? I like your suggestion, but to allow us the flexibility to go higher if we need to, as Danielle suggested. Okay. So we have sort of, we could do it eight months or set a time of appointment plus clean up at time of reappointments or clean up at time of annual appointments. Is that? And again, none of this precludes us for letting, well, precludes the mayor from, for cause, letting someone go. Okay. So we have to keep that in mind. Okay. Anything else on point number three? Dennis? I was going to ask Brandon, how did you come to eight months rather than, say, nine, which is, you know, an equal, an even division of a year? I mean, it sounds, it sounds nebulous. I'm interested in your thinking about it. Yeah, it is. It was a little nebulous. I just thought, well, you know, I wouldn't want to come and take a job with a one month guarantee. So that's, that's way too few, just a few months. And, you know, on the other hand, I was thinking our only other option was something like the 23 month appointment, which to bring people on through luck of the calendar and, you know, and give them two years without any reconsideration seemed like, you know, maybe other staff who had been brought on the month prior and who had a much shorter one would care. So I thought, well, okay, so pick some minimum that's somewhere in between one month and, you know, and a full year of guarantee, which might mean up to two years of appointment. And eight was somewhere in the middle. I know. Eight's a lucky number in China. I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. Well, then we'll, I guess when we're all done, we'll basically have a motion directing staff to bring us language associated with each of these points should this move forward. And we'll come back to this one and clean it up at that time, I think. But something, it'll be something that will allow us flexibility. Point number two is the employment agreements on, for those on the political appointment list. I don't want to touch who's on there yet, maybe unless we have to, but because I think this might be a little easier. Danielle, did you want to talk about the appointment process, as I recall, or the contract language was something like four weeks notice with one month for each year of service up to 12 weeks. Is that correct, Bruce? Yeah. And what were the other relevant? Four weeks minimum. Yeah. It's four weeks minimum, 12 weeks, I believe, is the maximum. Can you just tell me this section of the agreement where that's, because I've been sitting here trying to find it. I can't find it. It's one week's additional notice for each full year of service up to a maximum. What section are you reading from? Section 4A, page 3. Okay. So give the appointee written notice at least some number of weeks prior to appointee's date of termination. The mayor shall provide the appointee one week's additional notice for each full year of service up to a maximum of. Okay. That's why it's a blank, actually. So there isn't a suggestion. That's why I was confused. Okay. And the contract that we did see was 4 and 12, as I recall, right? Yeah, I see. Okay. So 4 and 12 was sort of the starting numbers, and I believe the mayor had an opinion on that. Yeah. Well, that's what I. That's what you're very comfortable with, right? Well, I said, that's what I said I agreed to, 4 and 12. I mean, I don't think there, under this mayor, there would be terminations unrelated to performance. So we're a little bit talking about angels on the head of a pin, I think. Okay. But 
I, th I think one of the things that one of the issues that that brought this up and I and, and I raised it in particular was 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 uh, recruitment and retention of of, of highly qualified staff and um, having a, a standard agreement out there to help bring those people in was was my concern um, so I mean the mayor's comfortable with four and twelve I'm comfortable with it um, if that's a good starting point we can leave it at that and move on to the hard one mm -hmm. okay I see a lot of yeses okay We'll move on to the hard one then. Okay. Uh, the tough one is to decide um, who the appointees are and who goes back to civil service. And just to let me let me let me summarize what I think people are saying. I see that there's agreement that the appointment list should include at a minimum the department heads for public works, police, fire, finance, community development, that's one, two, three, four, five, five people, uh, plus the chief administrative officer, plus the city attorney. I have seven. You had, you had six, Lynn. Did you include the I, city attorney? I, had, I did not include the finance department um, head, um, thinking that the CAO um, has ultimate financial accountability, well, along with us, um, and thinking he, he would be able to hire that individual. That was my thinking. Okay. Uh, so we have at least six, maybe seven then. Okay, let me put it that way. Um, there, are, there are, I think, some agreements that um, the four individuals in community development, planning division, building safety division, grants, and economic development would be civil service. No, there's some disagreement there. What was that? Did you say the four, the four individuals in community development that work under the city planner? Uh, Danielle. Okay, this is this is what I what I would suggest, Look, especially after looking at the appointment versus civil service, which was very helpful to see this chart that describes appointments versus civil service and what happens with which. Um, it's. It seems like department heads or division heads, um, uh, assistants, and those involved with policy setting should be appointed. So positions of leadership where policy is being made, um, may, it makes sense that those would be ap appointed positions. In some ways, the civil service process, it's there's, there's things I like about that process in that it seems to be a much more kind of um, equal process. In practice, when we have hired folks for appointed positions, we have very closely followed civil service proceedings, making sure that things are announced and advertised fully, that there's criteria, that there's full responding to candidates. In fact, I would consider that to be a professional way to conduct a job search with an equal opportunity employment office and I think we do that in fact it was actually disturbing to find out that you know we're not necessarily required to have advertising announcing criteria and responding to candidates I was shocked because I know <laughs> I know that our our policies are to actually do that on the other hand with civil service it's much more of a check it's a check mark kind of thing if you follow if you fit certain criteria then you you should be you know, brought in as a civil service employee. There's a, a leadership role is a role that goes beyond people fitting check boxes. A leadership role is a role where someone has, in addition to, to it's, it's actually the threshold is higher, in addition to them fitting all of this criteria, it is also the case that they should be uh, go through an interview process via committee and there should be an understanding of that person and their um, leadership potential. So I think I would support, uh, first off, in, in all of this, it's been difficult for me to understand why this is the first thing that was brought forward to us in employment, um, retention, and recruitment, particularly the recruitment piece, because I haven't 
been given any evidence that we lost X, Y, and Z person because of this. So it's been difficult for me to say, okay, this is where we should put our time. But given that, but I do trust that staff is bringing forward something that is, um, is noteworthy. And particularly with the contract piece, I think it's important that we establish contracts for people who are in appointment processes. At this point, I'm comfortable with the office supervisor in the finance department, the operations manager, public facilities manager, and fleet manager in public works not being political appointees. After that, I think that every single person on this list is either a department head, an assistant, or is involved in significant policy setting such that they should go through an appointment process. I'm happy to have a contract. I'm happy to custom negotiate agreements beyond those contracts because so that we can bring in qualified personnel. I'm happy to provide a certain amount of job security for folks in the, uh, the appointee process so that we can establish um, appropriate retention processes. But those are the only folks who I don't think fit those criteria. What, what, what those are office supervisor and finance department, public works, operations manager, public facilities manager, and fleet manager. Every other person on this list, having been on council for the last four years, they've been folks I've communicated with directly. I feel are in management positions, in policy setting positions. Very important that we that, that these folks are tied very closely to the mayor and the council and that we're able to work together. I don't see them in any way as equal to, say, a police officer or a person who works in the fire department. Those folks, it would be micromanaging for me to have a conversation with them because they, they um, report to their higher ups. And if I want to have a conversation with a police officer, I talk to the chief of police or a person in the fire department. I would either talk to a division chief or the, the, the chief of the fire. So, but with the other folks, I've had conversations with all of them. They have been policy setters. It, so it makes sense that they would stay on the appointment list. Dennis. Um, I rather like your thinking, Danielle, on that. Um, it does limit the number of people who are uh, considered for civil service down to rather a minimum. Um, maybe it's a little bit too severe. Um, in public works, I'd consider the arborist potentially. But I'm not sure how you think about that as far as policy setting. Um, what, and what was your list in the um, community development? I think that all of the people under community development fit either the description of being a department head, an assistant, or those involved in policy setting. I think it's been essential that the council has been involved in economic development manager hires. I think that council should and the mayor should be involved in the grants management hire. These are management level positions. They're leadership positions, and our hands are tied if we go through the civil service um, process of making sure that everybody fits check boxes. Mm -hmm. Lynn. Um, I would argue that our hands are not at all tied and that um, if we hold our, our uh, really most highly compensated executives uh, feet to the fire, as we well should, and hold them fully accountable for the people that they select for leadership positions, I mean, that's where we play a role. I, I would, I would uh, um, state that I, I think that keeping all of these for the most part, on the list of appointed it is an example of uh, really withholding um, or taking away job responsibilities that are truly the executive's job responsibility of hiring good people to help lead this city. And I think it takes away time uh, from us dealing with issues that I think are, are more uh, readily under our purview and more and issues that we really need to spend more time on. Um, and again, I think it doesn't take control away from us because we have the ultimate authority over who our CAO is, uh, over who our fire chief is, our police chief, all the leaders of these uh, small units of our um, city organization are accountable directly to the council and to the city. So that's where our authority and power comes. Lynn, I, I, I'm, Lynn I'm just trying to keep track of, of, of what people's summaries are here. So 
So, Lynn, the, the ones that you would... Um, um, just, if you just CAO, care, CAO, police chief, fire chief, director of public works, uh, council, city, council. Um, okay, city so, planner. Um, I believe that's six. Uh, five. Um, And you did not include and other executives except for the CAO? Um, you have six positions I, that I, you would. Who else? Who, so I included the, the city attorney. attorney. I did. Legal. Okay. Yeah. Personal yes. manager. And no. Okay. Okay. Uh, Robert. Well, I'll just say that it seems to be important for the heads of each department <coughs> to be Uh, appointed, I guess, and have a contract, I think that would lend itself well to stability. And I want to reiterate what I said before in that the head of the departments should empower the people under them. And we should, as a council, hold, as Lynn said, the executives to feet to the fire. And I think that's the appropriate way to handle it. So that's a minimum, you know, minimum number of appointees, and um, the rest go under civil service. Okay. Do you uh, go for six or for seven? Do you include the comptroller or not in your list? I think the comptroller should be there. Should be there. Okay. I just, oops. What, where did you have the comptroller? To be appointed or to not be appointed? To be appointed. Okay, so you have seven on your list. Okay, Brandon. Yeah, I, in studying this and talking to staff, I feel like the list Danielle gave is one that matches mine and that I would support. The originally, you know, I, I certainly am I'm for the goals of us being able to recruit and retain employees, and that is really the top thing we have to be considering in this. But in thinking about it, the length of this list isn't the primary thing that I've seen holding us back from finding and keeping good employees. The fact that people are appointed isn't something that has stopped good people from wanting to apply here and stay here. And um, the, the mayor asked a few questions. I, I think very few people have been not reappointed. Um, through this process and that there isn't a great danger because of this. I think the contracts help the situation further by giving people some security and some actual pay and some you know, notice of when they'll be leaving and compensation so that their job just doesn't end all of a sudden on July 1st. Um, I've also seen that it's helpful for the mayor to be involved in some of these hires. Um, the grants management hire is, is one that's been posted and the interviews have happened for. And I know because the mayor invited me to join her because I was interested in this position and we interviewed a finalist. I, I know and saw that it was helpful to have the mayor and to have council be able to talk to people, hear that they fit with the city and give input on their hire. Um, so. So I think that keeping this list a little longer is something I do support. And Charlie, in terms of what you're recording, I, I think the same four positions that Danielle listed are positions that clearly should not be appointed. The office supervisor, the public works operations manager, public facilities manager, and fleet manager. Those, those really aren't policy positions. They aren't department head positions. Um, and, and I certainly support removing those from the list because they just aren't people that need to be responsive to the council. But the rest of the list, I feel, do. I have a question. Lynn. Um, I guess this is a question for Bruce. Bruce, or maybe the mayor, it wouldn't, even though we did not appoint a particular position, it wouldn't preclude us from being involved in the interview process, would it? Not necessarily. I mean, I guess that's something we can decide. Um, 
Because I think Brandon's point is well taken. There may be some positions that we'd like to have input on. We'd like to, and I think your degree of closeness to what we're interested in, what we want to be involved with, is important. It's important for you to know that, and important for you to be responsive to us if that were to arise. And again, that's where our power lies, because we work directly with Bruce and the department heads. Yeah, I, I think we can come up with whatever we, we want to come up with. I think if you – we're less concerned from retention and recruitment if those remaining to be appointed do have the basic contract, mm -hmm. then you solve that problem. Having said that, I still believe the list is too long. It needs to be paired a little bit. I mean, we're, we're highly unusual with the number of people that we have as political employees. If it's four or eight or whatever it happens to be, that probably puts us – closer to where we want to be. As long as those remaining have at least some security and are not suffering from the at-will provision and there's some security in there, um, then I think we can address that. As far as the, the process, um, you know, there may – I guess it's how much that you want to be involved and how much the mayor wants to be involved and that's really, uh, really a call that you all need to make. And we can adapt to either, either method. We're, we're here to do what you want to do. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Heather and then the mayor. I would just like to um, agree with uh, Lynn's. I would, pro I would go seven um, and include the finance department head on there. But I'd like to note that the people who are here tonight <laughs> are the department heads. And, um, and to make special note of the fact that that would be appropriate in the sense that they are here and the other people that we currently appoint aren't here. So I just think it makes sense to to have a short list that rather than a very long list of people who obviously feel like maybe their feet are to the fire because they are here. Mayor Preston? Well, I don't feel comfortable uh, really drastically changing this list so early in my term <laughs> and I, I really appreciate um, Danielle's suggestions and um, I don't think that we have some terrible problem with insecurity because the record doesn't show that and um, I don't think we should be um, drastically changing things for a problem which doesn't really exist. And certainly people who don't want to be involved in this don't have to be involved, but there's no point in interviewing people and if you don't have the appointment power. So, you know, I, I think it we should make some obvious changes now and, and give it some time and see how it works. But I'm not convinced that we have some serious problem or that people should be told that we have a serious problem, that you can be fired at will. Well, most people in this world can be fired at will. So I, I think Urbana is a very stable environment for employees. And I think that's what the record shows. Danielle. I want to make it very clear that, um, that my arguments are not um, at all specific to the staff who we have right now. In fact, when I spoke about this initially, I made it clear that, that it's an issue of looking at the long-term um, structure of, of government and really setting things up for the next council, the next mayor, et cetera, doing, um, and, and looking at the form of government we have, which is a mayor aldermanic form of government. It is different than Champaign, um, I would say luckily. It is different than some other places that we might be comparing ourselves to when we say that the this appointment list is, is long. Um, we're unusual in that people in this community feel that they can come into the council chambers, speak, be responded to by <coughs> department heads, by a, a assistance to department heads, get results quickly. Um, the reason why we see so many people come into the council chambers here is because people know that when they show up and they speak, things happen. And it's really unusual. When you go to other cities and you talk to council members, they don't have crowds of people who come into their council chambers, largely because people feel that when they speak, they're not heard in those cities. And in the city, I, I feel like they, they really get, th we get things done. Because when you speak to council and appointees hear that, 
they feel tied and connected to council through the appointment process and they respond and are responsive and so i think that that the system that we have has worked from that perspective and so when i speak i'm advocating for the people who elected us i'm not advocating um and and actually there's i don't have any um i i think we have a great staff i think that um we've seen an incredible amount of output from our staff whenever people make fun of government being slow i think they're not really talking about urbana because in urbana we have a quick turnaround time for things people respond quickly we turn on the you know we turn on the dime and we're able to get things done and i think in part that's because there's this strong connection um when illinois power started chopping down the trees in our community and and uh, we had people mobilize and fill the council chambers and mike brunk who's sitting here in the in the audience championed the trees responded to people quickly and uh you know effectively stopped illinois power from doing the kind of excessive tree trimming that they were doing to try to to save costs and i think that that it, it you know it's it not only is it because mike brunk is passionate about trees and he's our arborist and he should be passionate about trees but i think it also has to do with that that strong connection through our structure between the people who who live in urbana and the and the people who are appointed um through the council as a mechanism to to, to do that we're different than other places we're different than the places that you work at um we're different than private entities and businesses where you might work in that it's you know you're not necessarily accountable to the public but the people who work here are accountable to the public and so i i feel strongly that the that that accountability plays out in council and the mayor having a hand in the hiring process and i've seen good things come out of that uh, out of having a hand in that and the civil service process if i if i read this correctly yeah sure we can be witnesses we can be onlookers but in terms of having influence it wouldn't be appropriate for have to, us to have influence in the civil service hiring process so i think that i think in some ways and I, I talked to so I did not talk to every division head and every assistant. I talked to some division chiefs. I talked to some people who are in assistant positions. And what I heard in, talk, in talking to them at length is that the contract issue, the lack of stability through a lack of contract, is really much more of an issue than being on this appointment list. And I think that's because we have a history of not, you know, we we don't off people at the appointment process. In fact as a as a city the responsible and professional thing to do is if someone has a performance related problem then we should respond to the performance related problem but i don't think we have a history of responding to things based on uh political persuasion or something like that um if you look at our workforce across the political spectrum we are very diverse in terms of our uh political appointees so i don't think that there that issue um really exists here so i do think we should work on the contract i and i really think that our we are um doing our constituents a disservice to to step some of the people on this list away one step away further away from the public i don't think that's good for the public Dennis, i'd be interested to to hear a little bit about um uh the contract um, uh, parameters that uh, would be offered. Are we talking about um, providing all appointed individuals a contract? And w is that a renewable contract? Yes, I support um, contracts because I think things should be spelled out for people. And um, it's renewable. And renegotiable? Sure. Okay. I really think, and in some ways, Daniel, I think you have a good point. There are some divisions where, due to the operation and how they're organized and what kinds of services they provide, we don't really see the people here in city council chambers very often or contact them. We usually contact the uh, department head. The one place we seem to be constantly talking to all the people is in community development where it seems like all these positions have a huge impact on directions the city goes and the kinds of um, programs that we initiate. So it seems to me that that, that department in particular um, should be, um, we, should, we should consider, you know, keeping a main amount of those individuals um, 
in appointment positions if we're going to maintain more than just department heads and public works is another department that has kind of significant individuals involved in um, development aspects of our city not all of them but some and I, you know I, we haven't like finalized our list or we I don't know when we actually will do that but is that gonna happen tonight well I think I think some people have made up their minds mm -hmm. uh, I have not yeah and I'm listening to the arguments mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm real curious to see where you come down on this and, and, and I need to figure out my own position on this. I know that I'd like to see the list shorter. Yeah, I think we have a really long list and I, and I would agree that it can be trimmed. Certain, certain departments though, we have so much interaction with them that I guess um, you know, I'd consider retaining some more of them than just the department head. And I think community development would be one of those. Um, I mean, I think grants management is a real significant position. Economic development um, has been a nebulous kind of area so far mm -hmm. in our history. I mean, pretty much unknown. So who knows about that? Uh, and I don't know much about building, um, building safety, but certainly planning division manager is a very key role. Um, you know, I don't know if whether it's, it's, it's wise to consider the assistant police chief as an appointed head. A lot of times the police, assistant police chief is like a, the, the chief, could be a chief contender for taking over the role of the police chief. That might be something that might be an, uh, want to be an appointment, appointed position. In the public works, um, the director, uh, the, the, maybe the city engineer, um, I might consider the environmental manager, I don't know. I guess I'm not sure about that, but that's a division as well. Okay. Um, I, I think Dennis, like myself, is not sure how much to trim off this list. Uh, my criteria, just so I can throw it out there, is uh, leadership role, the, the policy determining role that, that this individual plays in, in the department and for the city, um, the, the assistant level that, that, they, that they take. Uh, can this person step in and do the the full role of the of of the um, of that department, for example, or most of that role? Um, you know, so that, those are the things that I'm thinking in terms of, uh, and and I need to look at a little bit more. At, I need to I, I'm going to have to sit down and look at the the job descriptions of every one of these positions. I think to to make up my mind as to what level. Uh, or how much of those three criteria that each of these positions fill. Uh, I do know that at a minimum I would trim the four that have been mentioned, uh, but I, I think I want to go a little bit further than that. Uh, but I haven't decided how much further I would like to go. Uh, does that sort of reflect your feeling, Dennis? Yeah. I think even if we divide, if we, if we had half as many as we're on the list now, we'd be making a huge change. Okay, let's see. That's uh, not just I think it's uh, Lynn, then, then, uh, then Robert, then Danielle. Danielle speaks of a, of a sense of, of welcoming and responsiveness. And I don't think the sense of responsiveness at, at all is based on whether or not someone is appointed. I think it's based on um, the expectations that are set by the leaders and the council. So whether you're a civil service um, employee or whether you're an appointed employee, I would hope that the um, level of responsiveness, work ethic, welcoming of community input would be equally um, as important. So I don't see that as dependent on whether or not an individual is appointed or a civil servant. Um, well, I've listened to uh, all of us say our points. I definitely have mine. And I have, uh, sit back and ask myself the question, how did we get here with this discussion? And it seems like we've gone full circle in terms of looking at the variables. And we've heard from the mayor and her reluctance to uh, not necessarily uh, make this drastic of a move uh, early in, early on in this program. So I think in light of that kind of concern, I think Danielle hit the, hit the nail on the head, and I think it is in the contract range is where we need to talk about in terms of what we try to do. Um, 
if we change the complexion too much, it might be a, a drastic change. If we um, don't change it at all, I'm of the, of the opinion at this point that maybe the best thing we can do to salvage what we've discussed is to go with um, a contractual relationships that will improve the across the board uh, the feeling of those for retention and um, discuss at a later date what potentially uh, this government could do with regard to addressing the issue of the number of um, appointees. I think we've gone full circle. Um, we've got a, a good running vehicle. We might need a tune up, but we don't have to change the engine at this time. Okay. Danielle? Um, Robert in some way said what I wanted to say, which is I see a proposal for how to move forward at this point, kind of having heard from everyone. My um, biggest concern is that we're making a big decision as a fairly new council with a new mayor. And I feel like my what I'm speaking from is, uh, uh, is from a, a set of experiences that are fairly recent of the last four years that, with the exception of Charlie, aren't shared by council. And what I'd like to see is council have the opportunity to see what it's like to have this particular structure for a while. And if at the end, you know, towards in two years from now, if you see that you know, what I'm saying it does not mirror your own experience, then we could reconsider this list. But I, um, in some ways, I hear the conversation, and it's, well, should we do this? I haven't heard from the environmental manager. Well, of course you haven't heard from the environmental manager. You just got out of council. So if we could give some time for council members to actually see what these positions are about, in some ways, we're talking about positions that many of the people who are sitting here don't even know what those jobs are or what the kinds of responsibilities are. And I think in some ways it's, it's a little bit premature for us to move forward to try to take people off this list who we don't have a clear picture of whether or not they play a policy role. I would maintain that the people I listed play a policy role, but you'd have to believe me because I'm the one who's been here. In two years, you won't have to believe me. You can have your own opinions about these things. So I guess... Uh, I think Robert just put forward a good way to move forward, which is let's work on the contract, let's work on the minimum before a reappointment. If we want to take the four off the list that we can consent to, we could take them off now and um, be open to revisiting the list in the future. That would be my proposal in terms of moving forward cautiously, <coughs> making sure that we're not, you know, we're not doing something drastic without enough information. That is a way to move forward. Um, consensus? Do we want to hear the names of the, uh, the people who might then be moved off the appointment list to the civil service list? One more time? Well, the, the, the four positions that are common to all are uh, the office supervisor, the public works operations manager, public works facilities manager, and the fleet manager, those four positions. I mean, there's nothing well, to work. I, I would suggest that we move ahead with those four, that we move with contract changes, and that in one year, we as a council make a, uh, cons you know, decide that we will look at it again. Is that a motion? That is a motion. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Ms. Barnes and seconded by Ms. Chenoweth to move forward as proposed. I think the clerk has the motion? Yes. Okay. Um, how quickly would you want staff to come back with language uh, affecting these changes? I guess staff. How, I guess we should ask the staff how quickly they can come back with these. Well, this sounds like a great solution. We could come back with the contracts relatively short order since we already have the model. We would need to draft a. Once we take these four off the list, we need to draft a civil service amendment to add them to the civil service system. 
and we could come back, since we have a couple extra weeks in here, we can come back fairly short order on that. The only one I'm unclear on in terms of the, um, from a legal perspective on what to do is, is do we want to change the city code at all in terms of these appointments or just live with it the way we're doing it and deal with it in a year? Because as I, if you remember from last time, actually the city code only has those seven as appointees. Mm -hmm. And so, Except for the, it says the ends in the fiscal year. That's the right. point you have to get Jack's help on. So we want to maybe just live with our system the way we have it and <laughs> not worry about changing that city code until if it ever needs to be changed later yeah, on. I, if that's the case, then all we have to do is prepare the contracts and the civil service amendment. And okay. And I, and I don't think we expect it back even in two weeks. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think uh, probably bring it to committee in three weeks if you're okay. comfortable you we should it sh I think it should go through committee one more time uh, how do others feel yes. well if we postpone the city code aspect and focus on the contracts in the civil service inclusion amendment that shouldn't be too difficult okay three weeks brings it back to committee is that and Brandon tell me if I'm wrong where in writing if we don't do the city code part would we document the fact that there is a longer initial appointment for new employees In the contract. In the contract. Oh, yeah. We have to follow up with that. That may be a clean up. I'm not sure. I'd say. Well, I, I think, Bruce, we weren't, we weren't expecting this to go to council in two weeks. This was a study session. Can we bring it in pieces? Bring I think, what we I think, I think yeah. I think, I think in three weeks you report to us what you can. If we don't think it's complete enough to do the whole thing, we'll just keep it at the committee level okay. until it's ready. All right. Well, if we can get this done. Thank you for the direction. I will warn you, however, these were the low cost, no cost steps. Right. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. The ones no, are more difficult from here on. Yeah. Well, you know, um, <laughs> If, if you want to provide us additional information on the other things in yeah. three weeks, um, I assume there will be some hires between now and then and, and some movement on some of these positions right. anyway that we need to talk right. about. Um, and uh, at some point, I'd, I'd like to, s I guess I need to refresh my mind, memory on, on, the, on the job descriptions of each of these positions. I know that in our goal summary, which is something, let me, I want to throw something out before we go into closed session here. Um, we had talked about having one more caucus session on goals. Uh, and uh, Brandon and I have, have discussed a little bit, and we are prepared to have a final version circulating to council members for comment uh, in anticipation of a September 6th caucus meeting that would be at 6 o'clock, giving us an hour before the council meeting to, to, go, to go over our goals. Uh, does, does that work with people? I see one yes, two, three, Heather, four. That's uh, fine. Fine with everybody. Okay, so we'd, we'd shoot for a caucus to finalize our goals on Tuesday, September 6th at 6 p.m. And um, uh, so Brandon and I will, will finish summarizing it and get you copies for individual comment. Uh, and I know one of the things that in that goals stuff and one of the more complicated issues is the role of economic development manager. So, okay, anything else on this issue? Okay. Thank you for the uh, direction. Okay, yes. thanks. Uh, uh, at this time, I would entertain a motion to go into closed session. Uh, let's see, we should probably state it uh, completely here. Um, I move we go into closed session. You want to say the reason? Is there exact language here? Yes, there yeah, is. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Yes. Yeah. 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 So a motion to go into closed session as stated. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Stevens. Uh, any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Barnes? Yes. Mr. Bowersox? Yes. Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Okay, just for the public, uh, we will come back out of session 
and adjourn the meeting, there won't be anything to come out of that discussion that you haven't already been told by the mayor earlier.